Hello and welcome to the AIFC Court and International Arbitration Centre webinar series 2020, New Opportunities During and Post COVID-19. Uh, today we have webinar 15 in our 2020 webinar series. The topic is assessment of damages and consequences of cancellation. Today's speaker is Justice Sir Jack Beetson from the AIFC Court, uh, who is one of our most distinguished judges. Uh, Sir Jack is a former judge of the Court of Appeal in England and Wales, and he's a former Dean of the Faculty of Law at Cambridge University. We have one hour for today's webinar as usual. Sir Jack will give his presentation and we will then open the floor for questions. Um, if we may ask please you to type your questions in the Q&A option shown at the bottom or the top of your screens and Sir Jack will answer the questions at the end of his presentation. Um, a short update from myself if I may on behalf of the Court and Arbitration Centre Registry. Uh, both our Court and our uh, Arbitration Centre continue to provide all services 100% online without any disruption using our e-filing or e-justice system and video hearings. We have now had 93 cases across the Court and Arbitration Centre comprising judgments and orders, arbitration and mediation awards. All of this has been provided and will continue to be provided free of charge for the foreseeable future. Uh, this is an addition, of course, to this 2020 webinars programme. Um, I'd like to inform you all, please, that starting from the 30th of June until the 3rd of July, so next week, our Court and Arbitration Centre will contribute three webinars from this 2020 webinars programme as a part of the online Astana Finance Days. And there will be participation in this from our Chief Justice, Lord Mance, at the AFC Court, and from the IAC Chairman, Ms Barbara Doman QC. Information and registration details for all of this can be found at our Court and Arbitration Centre websites. Thank you very much, and I now hand over to Sir Jack. Thank you, Christopher, for putting together this informative and timely webinar series on the COVID-19 issues. Thank you also for explaining how the court and arbitration centre have continued to function effectively through the crisis. There have been very serious adverse effects on virtually all areas of economic activity as a result of government imposed restrictions and trading difficulties, such as the disruption of supply chains and the unavailability of personnel. This slide shows that there's been some recovery from the sharp falls experienced by markets in the first month, and there are exceptions, such as those whose business primarily operates online, and the couriers who deliver the products of such businesses and shipping companies. Um, pr previous webinars have dealt with substantive and procedural issues that have arisen or are likely to arise during the crisis. Next slide, please. My topic is going to be the assessment of damages, primarily for breach of contract. And also, I'm going to deal with the remedial consequences of cancellation. Now, there are other remedies than damages to compel performance of positive obligations or to prevent a wrongful act but uh, my assessment is that they may be of less relevance uh, in many cases, given current conditions. They shouldn't be forgotten. But the events triggered by the COVID-19 global pandemic are likely to be significant when assessing the quantum of damages available to a claimant, especially taking into account contractual rights to terminate. So after briefly looking at some general, the general principles, I'm going to focus on three questions. First, the remedial effects of the serious changes in market conditions and uncertainty. How does the damage regi damages regime deal with uncertainty and unforeseen consequences? What about the duty to mitigate and how are compensatory advantages to be taken into account uh, if, you're, uh, if, if, if the breach of contract means that although there's a loss, you have some compensatory advantage. Secondly, which date is used for the assessment of damages? Is it the date of the contract or is it the date of the breach or is it the date on which the contract is terminated? And thirdly, where the contract is terminated and damages are due, can events that happen after the termination be taken into account when quantifying damages? Given the coverage in previous webinars, in particular, 
of force majeure. Um, in the limited time, I will only briefly mention contractually agreed payments for non-performance and the consequences of cancellation and termination. Those matters include actions for the agreed price rather than damages. You promised to pay me 100, I want 100, irrespective of my loss and the possibility of a restitutionary remedy, I paid you a deposit of 100 and I want that back. Now, as far as damages are concerned, two sets of regulations deal with damages. There are the damages and remedies regulation, section nine of which is on your screen now, and there are the AIFC contract regulations, which largely but not precisely replicate the rules in the damages regulations. The contract regulations number three and was before the damages one and there are differences of wording many of which are not material and I'll refer to one difference of wording which may well be material. But anyway both sets of regulations are largely based on the principles of English contract law as envisaged in Article 4 of the AIFC's constitutional statute. I'm going to focus on the provisions in the Damages and Remedies Regulation, Regulation 17, because Regulation 17 was the one that was, it's later in number. They, they were made on the same day, but it looks as though the earlier one was drafted earlier. So I'm going to focus on that and the principles of English common law, including a number of recent decisions of the United Kingdom Supreme Court, which see Article 13.6 of the Constitutional Statute may be taken into account in interpreting AIFC regulations. My aim, like that of other serving judges of the AIFC Court, is to give an overview of principles and regulations about my topics which may be of particular relevance in the circumstances of COVID-19. It is not to commit myself or the court to a particular approach to specific issues which may come before it. So anything I say about the way the principles and the regulations might be applied is provisional, not meant to be expressing a view, and is subject to hearing full argument in due course in a live case about the way those principles and regulations apply to the concrete set of facts in that case. So the basic principle governing damages for breach of contract and for civil wrongs is compensation. As far as civil wrongs are concerned, I'm not going to say very much, but it's enough to say that in the regulations uh, on damages and remedies, sections 24 and 25, reflect the established common law principle that the victims of wrongs, including wrongs founded on a misrepresentation by the wrongdoer, are entitled to be put into as good a position as if no wrong had been committed. And of course, a misrepresentation may be a representation which leads to making a contract. So there may be quite close relationship between the remedies for damages for wrongs and damages for breach of contract. And the slide here that you have shows that both the contract regulations and the damages and remedies regulations reflect the long established common law principle that the primary measure of damages for breach of contract is the performance or expectation measure. It's to put the innocent party in the position that he or she would have been in had the contract been broken. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to slide over this next slide, uh, if Christopher shows it. That just shows the quote from the old 1848 case. Um, the expect, and if we go to the next slide, please. The expectation measure must be determined by reference to the terms of the contract. In many cases, as seen from um, 
sections 9 and 14 of the remedies regulations, that will be the difference in value between performance received and the performance promised in the contract, the market value. It may also be, however, the cost of cure, that is the cost of reasonable remedial work, providing that work's not disproportionate. There's a colorful example of disproportionate remedial work in the case of Rutsley Electronics and Forsyth. A man who liked swimming and diving commissioned a swimming area with a diving area of a specified depth. The swimming pool was built with a diving area that was less deep than the contract specification, but it was completely suitable for diving and there was no effect on the market value of the swimming pool. So the market value measure gives him zero. The man wanted the cost of cure. He wanted to take the swimming pool out and build a new swimming pool with the right depth. The cost of cure would have been almost 22,000 pounds. The contract price had been 17,000 pounds. The court said that this was disproportionate they awarded him two and a half thousand pounds for loss of amenity, but told him the swimming pool was safe to dive in, perfectly suitable, and that's that. So that, that's an example of disproportionality. Next slide, please. The next slide's about certainty of loss. And I'm now coming to the point that I'm going to focus on. Because the expectation measure is a forward-looking measure, it may be difficult to prove. It's very easy to prove, perhaps, in a market situation where you can just go out and buy alternative goods and you know what the goods would cost. But it may not be easy to prove. And it may, it may be in the conditions where markets have been dislocated, it's difficult to prove. And the AIFC regulations, section 11 of the remedies one, sets out what you have to do in terms of certainty. You have to establish the future loss with a reasonable degree of certainty. If you've got a loss of an opportunity, for example, an opportunity to tender for a contract, an opportunity to buy a house, then the damages will be in proportion to the probability of it happening. And there'll be, that'll be a fact dependent matter. And if, under the AIFC rules, the damages can't be established with sufficient degree of certainty, then the assessment's at the discretion of the court. Could we go to the next slide, please? The position in English law is similar. Difficulty in assessing damages doesn't disentitle a claimant from attempting to do so unless they depend on entirely speculative possibilities. And where the difficulty is because of uncertainty about a future event, and the claimant has lost a substantial chance, the damages can be awarded that are in proportion to the lost chance. And the two examples are given on the slide. Could we have the next slide, please? The next point concerns where a claimant, a, a person has a choice as to the way in which the contract would be performed. I'm obliged to deliver uh, oil to you, but uh, I have to deliver a minimum of 10,000 tons a week and a maximum of 100,000 tons a week. If I break the contract, damages will usually be assessed on the basis that I would have performed the minimum legal obligation. The assumption is that I would have performed in the way that is most favorable to me. But this isn't a fixed rule, and it's been suggested in the last case on this slide that it's a default rule, so that if the claimant can establish that you wouldn't have performed, the defendant wouldn't have performed in the most minimum way, then more damages could have got. This case is about the number of flights using a, an airport, where there was evidence that the airline uh, would have done more than the minimum. That's a slightly ironic example in the present time where most airlines and airports are really not very busy. Can we have the next slide, please? 
Another way of dealing with the difficulties of proving what would have been gained in the con had the contract been performed is for an innocent party to claim only the expenses incurred in preparing to perform or in part performing the contract, which were wasted because of the defendant's breach. They call this the reliance loss. You can recover these, and you can include expenses that you incurred before the contract was made, if those expenses are reasonably in the contemplation of the parties. And it was reasonably expected that those expenses would have been wasted because of the breach. So there were long negotiations with a, an actor to play a role in a film. And during those negotiations, the film company spent money getting ready for the whole thing. In the end, the actor made the contract but broke the contract. And the expenses that were recovered by the film company included those that were before the contract was signed. But the reliance loss can't be used to escape from a bad bargain. If you make a bad deal, you can't then say, oh, well, I, I, I just have what I've spent. So in the, the last case on this, the last two cases on this slide, a loss making contract was made. Uh, in one case, uh, it was a man built a wall uh, and then the, 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 the license to occupy the land was terminated. And in the Mamola Challenger, a charterer chartered a ship um, for less than the market rate. But nevertheless, that charter repudiated the charter party and, 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 and the contract was terminated. The ship owners were unable to recover expenses incurred in, 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 because the expenditure would have been wasted even if there had been no breach. So for these reasons, the reliance loss is better seen as an alternative method of assessing the innocent party's expectation where it's difficult to prove the lost expectation or where the expectation is a non-financial one. Incidentally, the burden of proving that a contract was a bad bargain lies on the contract breaker. So the innocent party can sue for the reliance loss, and then it's for the contract breaker to say, but you, you never would have recovered that. Could we have the next slide, please? The next way of dealing with uh, the difficulties of proving expectation loss is one that's been recently considered by the United Kingdom Supreme Court. It's for the damages to be a sum reflecting the price the victim of the breach of contract could have charged the contract breaker for releasing him from the contractual duty. In the case, Morris Garner, what it was, was a non, there was breach of a non-competition and confidentiality agreement concerning the supply of, of, of labor. Uh, and they couldn't prove what the gain would be. And so they sued saying that what they wanted was what they would have charged to release the contract breaker from the contract. Now this, if, if, if such damages are awarded, they, it will be better than expectation loss if no loss can be proved or the loss is otherwise irrecoverable. And so this measure may be better both than expectation damages and damages under the reliance measure because you can't save yourself from a bad bargain. But there are two major uncertainties about it. The first one is whether they're really compensatory. The Supreme Court held that they were. They sort of regarded it as a compensation for a lost opportunity to bargain for a release. The alternative is that they're restitutionary. They are removing the gain made by the contract breaker from breaching the contract where the gain is greater than the loss suffered. The loss suffered in the Morris Garner case was between three and 4.6 million pounds. The, hyper, the evidence about the hypothetical release fee was estimated to be between 5.6 and 6 million pounds. The second point of uncertainty 
is, and more importantly, perhaps, than the purpose, is when they can be awarded. The United Kingdom Supreme Court said they may only be awarded in two situations, and it held that neither applied to this case. The first situation, A in the slide, is where the breach of contract consists with an interference of a property right or a similar right, what Lord Reed described as a valuable asset created or infringed by the right. And the second one is where the breach of contract is anticipated but hasn't occurred and da damages are awarded in substitution for specific performance or an injunction. Now the principles governing the award of specific relief, which I'm not focusing on, are uh, well known and well established. Damages must be an inadequate remedy, there mustn't be uh, you mustn't, it mustn't be burdensome or a personal contract to, in, to specifically enforce it. And I'm not going to say anything more about that. But the first situation of where the right is similar to a property right, where it's like a valuable asset, and does create certainty because it's not clear from the decision what rights count as closely analogous to proprietary rights. Why couldn't it be said that the purpose of the non-competition clause was to protect the claimant against the loss of a valuable asset, namely business profit, including loss of goodwill. I leave you with that, that's an open question. Next slide, please. We now come to the date for assessment of damages for breach of contract. It's a key question for both disputes predating COVID-19 and new ones arising out of the party's reactions to the difficulties caused by it. The starting point in all cases is normally the date of the contract's breach, but the overall effect of the cases in England and other common law countries is the adoption of a flexible approach. And the, 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 the nutshell account of the scenario from the Attorney General of Ghana and Texaco shows how important the date is. That was a case in which between the contract's breach date and the date of trial, Ghanaian currency had suffered a catastrophic value, fall in value against other major trading, trading currencies. This was a failure to deliver a cargo of oil. Damages at the date of breach were 7.9 million Ghanaian sedis, which at the date of breach was $2.8 million. But by the date of trial, it was $21,100 because of that collapse. Uh, in fact, the House of Lords held that the um, damages were to be awarded in Ghana and Saidi, which in fact meant that they'd only get the value as at the date of trial. Now, neither the AIFC remedies regulation nor the contract regulations directly address this question of date, but the references in sections 10 of the remedies regulation and in 111 of the contract regulations to the loss or value caused by the non-performing parties failure or deficiency and to loss caused by non-performance suggests it will be the date of the breach so the position will be the same. As I've said contract breach dates appropriate uh, where substitute performance is readily available in the market and I've also said and could we have the next slide please that there is flexibility. It's not contract breach date will not be appropriate if restrictions because of market disruption because of COVID mean substitute performance is not available. It's not an absolute rule. There are three cases showing what uh, when you can depart from it on the slide, which I'm not going to go into. The important point, in fact, is to say that as far as the last of these cases, which is a, a fairly a decision six years ago by Mr. Justice Popplewell, suggesting that 
you can only depart from the date of breach day where it's necessary to give effect to the overriding principle and where it's consistent with the alloc agreed allocation of risk. The second of these is absolutely true. The first of these uh, may be more easy to show in the circumstances of the pandemic. That was a case about breach of warranties in a share purchase agreement where the market conditions were absolutely ordinary, but the impact on the share value turned out to be less than anticipated at the date of breach. The next thing I want to look at is, if we go to the next slide, is what happens where a party has terminated the contract and yet the amount of loss has been affected by events after the contract. Those events can be taken into account in a suitable case. The golden victory is a split decision. A majority held that where a charter broke a charter party and the owner terminated the contract for that breach. But two years later, the Iraq war broke out and a war clause in the charter party would have entitled the charter to breach it, the losses were limited by that period because it was assumed that had the contract still been on foot, the charters would have exercised their right under the war clause to terminate. That the ship owner had not, in fact, attempted to mitigate its loss by entering into a substitute charter. So there, there were perhaps other um, difficulties with the ship owner trying to argue for the contract breach date. That case had a strong minority decision dissenting. They would have held that the damages should be assessed on the date of the breach and later developments such as the termination, the entitlement to terminate and the war left out of account. They did that because they expressed concerns about certainty, finality and ease of settlement between the parties. But the majority approach was emphatically upheld in the last case on the slide, which was the cancellation of a sale of wheat after a Russian prohibition of exports was announced, but before it came into effect. And basically they took into account the date that it came into effect rather than the date that it was announced, which is when the breach was. Uh, and, and the principle was held to apply to one-off contracts as well as to long-term contracts such as a charter party. What these two cases show are strong uh, statements, particularly in the more recent one of Bungi and Nidara, favoring the ability to take into account what is known by the date of trial, whether the contract would have remained in force. And so as it may be argued that a contract would have been terminated, for example, by reason of frustration or a force majeure clause or force majeure factors such as section 82 of the contract um, regulations arising either from COVID-19 or from a government response to it, we can see how the passages in these cases will be relied on in the coming months and years. Next slide. I'm going to go over this pretty quickly. Um, the breach must be the effective cause of the loss. It's not enough to show that it's but for. Um, this is largely a factual matter uh, and there's nothing more to be said. Could we have the next slide, please? We come to remoteness. A defendant is not liable for all loss that a claimant has suffered, even where the breach is the effective cause of the loss. Certain losses may be too remote. So another key question for both disputes predating COVID-19 and new ones arising out of parties' reactions is whether the loss that's been suffered is too remote to be recoverable. Now you've got both the contract regulations and the uh, remedies regulations on the slide. The first slide, the, the top one is the remedies and the second one is the contract. And you'll see from the material in red that the test is foreseeability of loss, but in the remedies regulation it's what could they have foreseen at the time of non-performance, whereas in the contract one it is 
What could they have foreseen at the time of the conclusion of the contract? Well, you can see, obviously, that this may be a very significant difference. How it pans out in cases in which AIFC law is applied uh, in the court or in arbitrations will be a matter for the court or the arbitrators to grapple with if this issue comes before them. Both the court and the arbitrators will get assistance from the position in the common law world, but perhaps also from that in civil law systems and international agreements such as those in Unidois uh, and the Vienna Convention on the Sale of Goods. If we could have the next slide, please. In common law, we go back to Hadley and Baxendale, it's things that arise naturally according to the usual course of things, usual things, or things that were reasonably contemplated by the parties at the time they made the contract. Interestingly, Hadley and Baxendale used cases from the French civil, from French law and the French civil code in formulating its rule. So that shows that English law is definitely in the camp of the part, what the parties contemplated or foresaw at the time of the contract. Uh, I think that the difference between contemplate and foreseen reflects a semantic verbal difference rather than a substantial one. There's English authority supporting that, so I'm not going to concentrate on that. But the difference between the time of the contract and the time of the breach uh, is important uh, and uh, I think will, will require careful consideration in the context of a particular, a particular set of facts. Could I have the next slide, please? There are two factors that uh, I want to mention based on recent cases, relatively recent cases. First of all, a loss will be too remote, even if it's contemplated, if the defendant didn't assume responsibility for it. And a loss will not be too remote, even if it is... Um, something that in an abstract way is not foreseen if the defendant did assume responsibility for it. The first of these propositions is illustrated by this case, the Achilles, where because of a, a, sh a ship was delivered nine days late, the owner renegotiated the follow-on charter and market rates had dropped so he would have he lost 1.3 million on the follow-on charter but he could only recover $158,000 for the nine days because it was the understanding of the shipping industry and that's thus an implied term in the contract that only the follow-on period was recoverable and in the super shield case uh, a system to prevent fire and prevent uh, flooding in a factory uh, failed. There was a loss by flooding because the fire sprinkler didn't work properly. That loss by flooding wasn't reasonably contemplatable as, as a serious possibility at the time of the contract, but the court held that the contract breaker, the company which in Super Shield, which neither was neither super nor it did its shield, had assumed responsibility for the loss. The very purpose of its duty was for there to, to stop there being excess water and the flooding. Next slide, please. We move to mitigation. Um, the AIFC damages and remedies regulations, section 16 and section 117 of the contract regulations reflects the principle of English jurisprudence. You're not liable for loss suffered to the extent that the innocent party could have avoided or reduced the loss by taking reasonable steps 
but you are entitled to recover expenses reasonably incurred in trying to reduce the loss. Next slide, please. This is a question of fact, uh, and so there's little, not much that I can say, but the three cases show that you don't have to do things that are not in the ordinary course of business, you're not expected to accept goods of an inferior quality, and you're not expected to take steps that you can't financially award, afford. There is a margin given to uh, the victim of a contract breach. And the, adva the, the advantage will not be deducted where it is merely, the, sorry, next slide please, which deals with another aspect of mitigation, which is about compensating advantages. Sections nine and 110 of the AIFC regulations, which are on slide three, reflect the position in English common law. If a party mitigates the loss and obtains a compensating advantage, that advantage will be deducted provided it arose directly from the breach and the act of mitigation. It will not be deducted if it's merely an indirect or collateral benefit, such as the money you get under an insurance policy or the proceeds of selling a ship which had, that was re-delivered two years before the charter party. I now come, and more briefly, to what happens where there's been an agreed, a provision in the contract providing an agreed sum for non-performance. Uh, the regulation 21 and section 21 and section 122 reflect uh, the um, common law position. Uh, you're entitled to that amount irrespective of the actual loss, but you can't get that amount if it is manifestly disproportionate to the loss envisaged as capable of arising and resulting from non-performance. Rather than giving you lots of cases, I put on this slide a paraphrase from uh, now Lord Burroughs' restatement of the English law of contract, section 23, uh, and the effect of the recent, fairly recent Supreme Court case in Cavendish Square Holding and El Macadesi. So you, you only get the sums stipulated as liquidated damages if it's not a penalty. In other words, if it's, if it's not disproportionate. And it's not a penalty if it's not out of proportion to a legitimate interest in the performance of the contract. And in particular, if it is a genuine pre-estimate of the party's loss. Again, a term which in the event of breach requires the defendant to do something other than to pay a, a stipulated sum, for example, to transfer shares or not to pay a sum that would otherwise be owed will also be unenforceable for being a penalty if it is out of proportion to a legitimate interest of the defendant, of the claimant in the performance of the contract. And a term which allows the claimant to forfeit from the defendant a right to repayment, repaying money, for example, a deposit or a proprietary or possessory right may also be unenforceable if it is uh, disproportionate. And what you get for that is relief against forfeiture, for example, by given, being given further time. Next slide, please. I now turn to the consequences of force majeure. Now, this was um, covered in uh, the position under the AIFC rules and Kazakh rules and English rules was covered in er the earlier webinars in this. So I'm not going to say very much. The articles, sections 80, 82 of the contract regulations allow you to have an excuse for non-performance if non-performance is due to an impediment beyond your control, which could not have been taken into account at the time the contract is excused. Um, but a party who's obliged to pay money and doesn't do so may be required to pay it, although non-performance 
is due to an impediment beyond its control. Um, at common law, and in the English cases, whether a force majeure clause suspends or terminates performance, whether it provides a mechanism for allocating past losses, depends on the construction of its terms. And I think that, that, those, were, that those factors were dealt with. So I don't want to say more about that. Next slide, please. What is important and perhaps has, has been less emphasized is the possibility not of contractual damages, but of restitution. And this is dealt with in uh, sections 48 and 49 of the remedies regulations. There's a right to restitution if the remedies expressly provided under the contract regulations. I, I've looked and I haven't found uh, an express provision for restitution under the contract regulation. There may be one, but alternatively, restitution is available if there's been an unjust enrichment of a party at the expense of another party, and there's been no subsequent change in the position of the enriched party that would make it unjust to order the enriched party to restore the benefits. Uh, and that, uh, there is some common law cases that will help us to understand what that means. Uh, the section 49, states that if you can't get restitution, then the court may award damages that would put you in the position you would have been if the conduct giving rise to the loss had not happened. So that's not expectation or negotiating damages. That is more like, that is more like damages for loss. Uh, and so damages instead of restitution may not be the, uh, as good as negotiating damages if you have them. At common law, an innocent party can recover money paid under a contract so long as the contract has been terminated by the breach and the, what we say the consideration for the payment has failed. I, in other words, the person who paid the money got nothing in return for it. So if you pay money in advance under a contract, for the, for the delivery of goods and the seller of the goods breaks the contract and the contract is terminated and you've received no goods, you can get your money back. As far as this remedy may be available, and this is what's interesting here, also to a party in breach. I may pay money under a contract, I then break it, and there are limited circumstances where I can recover that money. One of these cases was a case of for the contract for the sale of rifles. And it was held that if it's only an advance payment of the price and not a deposit, then it's recoverable less any damages suffered by the payee. In that case, they'd sold rifles to people fighting in the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s. They'd paid in advance, the war ended, but the Second World War was about to start in Europe. So there was plenty of markets for rifles. And so the contract breaker who didn't need the, the rifles because they'd lost the war in Spain, got the money back, less any damages suffered by the payee. The payee didn't suffer any damages because the price of rifles had gone up. It's an unusual situation. If it is a deposit rather than simply an advance payment of the price, it's generally irrecoverable unless it's a penalty. And I've talked about those factors. The same position applies for non-monetary benefits. If I've rendered services or supplied you with goods, I can get the reasonable value of the services of the goods if I'm an innocent party I may do better than the contract price uh, because I get the value of the services and it's not limited to a proportion of the contract price. So it may be more favorable. Um, I, the slide shows a decision of the high, a recent decision of the High Court of Australia, their most senior court, uh, which has got a very useful discussion in it. The party in breach has no right to recompense for goods uh, 
provided services rendered, except where the other party freely accepts them. So in the case on the slide, Sumter and Hedges, a builder was going to construct something on land and he broke the contract and went away, uh, leaving a lot of bricks on the site. The landowner employed another builder to finish the work and the, they used the bricks. The landowner was made to pay the reasonable value of the bricks used, which had been left, but he didn't have to pay for the bricks that had been used before the, before the breach because he had no choice about those. Those had already been installed. So that, that's restitution. Next slide, please. Finally, frustration. Where a contract is discharged for frustration, there's a statutory regime, but it reflects the common law. You get your money back and money that is payable ceases to be payable, but the court may allow a deduction reflecting the sort of change of position defense where the pay is incurred expenses and where a non-monetary benefits being concerned, conferred, then the court may order a suitable sum to be paid. The main English case on this concerns the effect of the nationalization in Libya of BP's uh, oil uh, uh, facilities uh, and, and, and the effect on various con uh, con the contract with Nelson Hunt and Bunk, with, uh, with Mr. Hunt. So I think that, it, that brings me to the end of what I want to say. I think that the, the overall message is one of flexibility within clear principles. That is how the English law of contract and the English commercial contracts have developed uh, without it there being based on a statute. And it is how I take it that both the contract regulations and the AIFC, the, the AIFC remedies regulations seek to operate. Um, as I said when I early in the talk, how it actually pans out in a given case will be a matter that will be decided depending on the facts and the arguments uh, in that particular case. Thank you very much.